This channel is part of the History Hit Network. driving a truck down a mountain road. Nothing unusual about this, except that the last two trucks which tried to make this trip never reached their destination. Behind the wheel of the truck is an American soldier assigned to United States Army Special Forces operating in one of the most dangerous regions of Southeast Asia, the guerrilla-infested central highlands of Vietnam. He is here to assist, to advise, and to help a remarkable people who have been called upon to progress in a single decade from a peaceful, primitive life into the violent 20th century. As Commander-in-Chief, the late President Kennedy left to us this directive. We need a greater ability to deal with guerrilla forces, insurrections, and subversion. We must be ready to deal with any size of force, including small, externally supported bands of men. And we must help train local forces to be equally effective. This is the story of what one group of Americans are doing today to carry forward that far-sighted policy. The undeclared war raging today in South Vietnam is not being fought in the streets of cities. Since the guerrilla onslaught began in the late 1950s, the Republic of Vietnam has had little trouble in retaining control of the great urban centers, the place names on the map. But the central highlands, the Wan Son Cordillera, are a mountainous, largely jungle-covered region remarkably like those mountainous regions of Spain where the term guerrilla was born. Here, everything favors the lightly armed, fast-moving irregular, and it is here that the struggle for Vietnam may ultimately be decided. For the Wan Son dominates both the rich rice bowl of the Mekong Delta to the south and the narrow, densely populated coastal plain bordering the South China Sea. Into this remote, almost impenetrable region, the communists of North Vietnam have infiltrated a steady stream of agitators, terrorists, and professional guerrillas. Their target is not only the highlands, but the whole of Vietnam. Military strategists on both sides of this struggle are agreed that he who gains the highlands will have won the fight for Vietnam. The military and political history of few nations have been so greatly influenced by geography. For more than 900 years, the emperors of China dominated all Vietnam, except the highlands. Here in the 13th century, the Mongol emperor Kublai Khan suffered one of his few defeats. 
And here, in our own century, were mustered the revolutionary forces which overwhelmed 180,000 highly trained French troops in the campaign's climax by Dien Ben Phu. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. From the Battle of Trafalgar and the Revolutionary Era, right through to the Second World War, if you are looking for your next military history fix, then this is the service for you. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. Villages of the Highlands are inhabited by many races, each with a tradition and a way of life distinctly its own. Known to the outside world by the French term Montagnards, or mountain people, they are known to themselves by such tribal names as Rade and Mong, are vastly different from the light-skinned lowlanders whom the world knows as Vietnamese, believed to be the original inhabitants of the region before the arrival of the Vietnamese more than 2,000 years ago most of the Montanards continue to live a Stone Age existence in the midst of the 20th century. Confined for centuries to the isolated areas of the plateaus, the Montanards have little contact with the city dwellers of the lowlands, take little interest in the complexities of modern life. For most of them, Vietnamese is a foreign language. For such people, words like communism and democracy have little meaning, cannot without great difficulty even be translated into their own dialects. Here in the mountains, both Saigon and the communist capital of Hanoi seem equally remote and unimportant. Through these mountain villages for more than a decade have passed increasing numbers of communist guerrillas, befriending the villagers, rewarding those who cooperate, terrorizing those who resist, the guerrillas have converted much of the highlands into a secure staging area for their assaults on the roads and population centers of the lowlands below. Americans encountering these people and this situation often feel transported 200 years back into time to our own French and Indian wars when British and French vied for support of Indian tribes on the frontier. And like the primitive tribesmen of those earlier wars, the Montanard on his own ground is a formidable ally. Tough, muscular, a skilled hunter and woodsman, a man of great personal courage, the Montanard holds the key to a strategically vital area of Southeast Asia. If he can be won to the government's cause and given the training and equipment to resist communist terrorism, the guerrilla's jungle sanctuary in the Vietnamese highlands will disappear. With this in mind, United States military advisors and the government of Vietnam early in the 1960s began a program to win the active allegiance of the Montanards. Their primary objective was to seal off the hidden supply routes through the mountains from the communist north. Chosen to execute the plan were the anti-guerrilla experts of the U.S. Army Special Forces, accompanied by Vietnamese Special Forces, whom they themselves have trained and through whom the bulk of their work in the village will be performed. Equipped with all the skills of the highly trained airborne infantryman, the Special Forces soldier brings with him a number of unique abilities designed to meet just such situations. Selected for linguistic aptitude and a talent for tact and diplomacy, Special Forces personnel are adept at winning friends, from the village chief down to the lowliest peasant. Going into a Montanard village for the first time is an experience you don't soon forget. In the first place, the only people you're likely to find are the ones who were too old or too young or too sick to run away when they saw you coming. You give candy to the kids, uh, talk politely to their elders, and try to convince everybody that you're not here to hurt anyone. 
There's no way of knowing whether the men have run away because they're guerrillas themselves or because they believe guerrilla propaganda about the government troops and the terrible Yankees. All you can do is keep your guard up and try to show by actions that you're here on a friendly mission. Our biggest asset in this kind of thing is the team medic. His main job, of course, is taking care of us. But there are no field hospitals in guerrilla fighting, so one of our medics has to know a lot about his business. With the modern medicines available, he can do a lot for people in places like this. The odd thing is, when you first ask whether anybody's sick in the village, the first answer is usually no. So then you offer to examine anyone who thinks he might be sick. And in no time at all, you've got a waiting line. What gets you most are the kids. They say people don't miss what they've never had. But you bring medicine into one of these villages where they've probably never seen a doctor, and the people turn out to be just as worried about their kids as you are about yours. Pull an aching tooth or Save a man's eyesight, and you've made a friend for life. You do this kind of work because you've got the medicine and because you're here. And God knows it needs to be done. In some of these villages, half the people have TB. Most of the kids have impetigo and everybody has vitamin deficiencies. Any decent human being coming into a setup like this would do what he could without asking for a reason. But the fact remains that from a military point of view, this is a good tactic. Squads and platoons of Viet Cong guerrillas have been coming through here with promises. Now, thanks to our medic, we've come along with something a lot better, something we can give them now. The village chief is impressed, but he is also a man on a tightrope. Unless his new friends can provide adequate protection, cooperation will lead to Viet Cong attacks, a devastated village, or his own assassination. The chief makes his decision. The young men are summoned back from the bush. They will train with the American and Vietnamese special forces. They will make a stand. And so, Montanards of fighting age assemble. The first step is taken toward recovery of a communist-dominated area within the borders of South Vietnam. All this is taking place in what is, to all intents and purposes, enemy territory. Much will have to be accomplished before anyone here sleeps without a gun close to his pillow. Is it possible to make soldiers out of men almost untouched by the 20th century? What kind of supplies do you issue to men who have never worn pants or shoes? Mountain men are fighters everywhere. 
the Ozarks, the Scottish Highlands, or the Highlands of Vietnam. Get yourself a mountaineer and you've got potential fighting material. These people may be primitive, but they know what a weapon is and what it's for, even when they still haven't learned how to use it. These people are hunters. They're a peaceful people, basically friendly. Without this guerrilla business that's been going on here for the last 10 or 20 years, you'd be as safe walking through the highlands as down a street back home. But being hunters, these men grow up fitting arrows into a crossbow. And from a crossbow to an M1 carbine is not as big a jump as you might think. One thing mountain people aren't always so big on, though, is uh, discipline and organization. We had to teach our mountain yards uh, to coordinate with such modern inventions as an aerial resupply drop. And that took a certain amount of doing. Montenard's great assets as a fighting man is the energy, the mileage he can get out of a single bowl of rice. Incidentally, uh, this training program was by no means a one-way street. Our own food supplies were supposed to be obtained, as it said in the orders, uh, through normal civilian channels. In practice, this meant a special forces sergeant our weapons specialist, to be exact, learning how to bargain with Vietnamese shopkeepers in the nearest town. A part of the ritual involves sharing tea with the proprietor and his family while everyone argues politely about uh, prices. Our weapons specialist became an overnight authority on chickens, cabbages, and bacon on the hoof. Not to mention the purchase of 2,800 pounds of rice and miscellaneous other commodities. Classes for the Montanards were conducted whenever possible by U.S. and Vietnamese special forces working together. It was a complicated operation. The Vietnamese weren't much better off than we were. Most of the lecturers required two interpreters. There were Vietnamese who spoke English and a few Montanards who spoke Vietnamese. One of us would give the lesson to an English-speaking Vietnamese. The Vietnamese would then have to pass it on to a villager who understood Vietnamese. The native interpreter would then pass it along to the trainees. So much can get lost in translation that you have to say everything at least twice. That kind of thing takes time, but it's the only kind of training that pays off under these conditions. The students themselves were amazing. They took to modern firearms faster than most of us thought possible. These men came to us with almost none of the background you'd expect a trainee to have. Most of them couldn't read or write. Most of them couldn't even pass a draft board physical back in the States.
They're smart. They've got guts. And they're anxious to learn. Most important, what they're learning how to defend is their own home, their own families. With that kind of motivation, you can overcome a lot of handicaps. We had to hit the high points of six months' worth of training in only a few weeks. But the lesson seemed to take. Our Montanards were shaping up into some of the best anti-guerrilla fighters in Southeast Asia. In a very few weeks, they progressed from simple hand weapons to the tricky business of demolition. Even radio communications were taken in stride. This was even more surprising and maybe more important. It meant that before we left, radios could be issued tying our friendly villages together in a sort of mutual protection association. Guerrilla bands moving in on an isolated village would touch off an automatic alarm throughout the network. Togetherness is a big thing with these people. When father goes off to training camp, the family goes along. But they still take to soldiering as fast as any group you're ever likely to see. Within a few weeks after seeing their first rifle, these characters were going through an infiltration course as rugged as anything they've got at Fort Bragg. They also had no trouble learning the tactics of resisting a night assault. This burning arrow technique is designed to point out guerrilla positions to aircraft answering a radio call for help. Thank you. 
This is what the Army calls a confidence course. Here it seemed a little like teaching birds to fly or monkeys how to climb trees. Convincing them of the importance of night patrols in the jungle was a little more difficult. Their inclination was to stay home and man the barricades. We had to persuade them that unless you attack and ambush the gorilla on his own ground, he'll turn your village into a shooting gallery. Once convinced, as usual, they learn fast. The Viet Cong who gets within a mile of the village these men are patrolling is going to be as scared of them as they used to be of him. The gorilla is a fish, said Mayo Tse Tung, and the sea in which he swims are the people. If the people be unfriendly, he cannot survive. Operation Montanard is an exercise to teach the mountain people of Vietnam the art of anti-guerrilla warfare. It also involves giving them a better understanding of the issues, of what the war of subversion raging in their country is really all about. Through no fault of their own, the future of these mountain people is inextricably bound up with the outcome of the struggle against communist expansion in Southeast Asia. Operation Montanard has given them the weapons and organization to resist guerrilla terrorism. Contacts with U.S. and Vietnamese anti-guerrilla experts during the many weeks of training have also made fast friends where there was before only fear or indifference. Departing, men of the U.S. Army Special Forces leave behind a well-trained group of friends who may in time have a profound effect on the future of Vietnam. In the spring of 1965, the 1st United States Army combat troops were committed to the conflict raging in South Vietnam. Viet Cong, fearful of the new M16 automatic weapon, called them the men with the little black rifles. Hanoi Hanna called them juvenile delinquents in green t-shirts. They were American paratroopers of the 173rd Airborne Brigade, and with fierce pride in their outfit, they called themselves the Sky Soldiers. Just back from Vietnam, a freelance correspondent documents the story of the unusual breed of fighting men known as the Sky Soldiers. To learn their story, he lived with the paratroopers of the 173rd Airborne Brigade, followed them through the steaming jungles and rice paddies of South Vietnam, where they have made history. The first time I saw them was the morning of May 5th, 1965. A 
seemingly endless stream of big-bellied silver C-130s began landing at Benoit Air Base, about 18 miles northeast of Saigon. Along with other correspondents, I'd gone to Vietnam to cover the arrival of the first U.S. Army combat troops. Watching them disembark, you couldn't help seeing that there was a special quality about these men. Young? Sure. But the way they moved and formed up without any confusion, well, there was a feeling you get when you're watching real pros. They knew their business. After seeing them, I decided that I would stay in Vietnam and see these paratroopers in action. Brigadier General Ellis Williamson, commander of the 173rd, had arrived on the lead plane. Asked how long before his troops would be ready to begin patrols, he answered, tonight. As a matter of fact, it was a lot sooner than that. In only a few hours, there was a perimeter guard about the airbase. And patrols were moving out beyond the barbed wire. It was the first time in more than a year that any troops had made extended patrols outside the area. Besides setting up brigade headquarters at Benoit, a task force was landed at Vung Tau. It consisted of an infantry battalion with engineer and medical unit, and its job was to secure and defend that airfield. A few days later, the rest of the brigade's personnel and equipment arrived by sea. They proceeded by road convoy to Benoit. Now, with all of its men and equipment, the 173rd was set to get rolling. The next two weeks were spent in sharpening combat techniques and revising tactics. These included eagle flight, fast strikes on targets of opportunity. and foot patrols in hostile areas. At the same time, the armor troops and the cavalry were making a show of force on the network of roads and conducting reconnaissance. Once secure, the roads came alive with native transport. For the first time in many months, the people of the province could journey to market and visit friends and family. The 173rd is a separate brigade, meaning that it's not part of a division. It's self-contained, the first airborne brigade to be so classified. At that time, the combat units consisted of two battalions of infantry. an artillery battalion with three firing batteries, a cavalry troop, and a company of armor. Combat support units included a medical company, a company of engineers, a maintenance company, signal and communications units, transport, supply, and administration. Independence of movement was provided by two platoons of troop-carrying helicopters and a gunship platoon. With the Benoit area made secure, large-scale attacks against the enemy were mounted. The largest of these took place at the end of May and employed nearly all of the combat units in the brigade. The infantry. Artillery. And cavalry. As well as engineers and a platoon of volunteers from administration, supply and maintenance units. 
It seemed as though everybody wanted to get into the act. The operation was strictly an infantry-type air mobile assault. The landing zones had been pounded by the Air Force. Then, minutes before the task forces arrived, Army gunships of the brigade made a final sweep. The gunship platoon, nicknamed the Cowboys from their radio call sign, softened up the landing zones, or LZs. Then the first task force swung into action. It was made up of cavalry, engineers, support troops, and artillery. Their first mission was to secure the LZs for the other two task forces. When the other two task forces landed, the first elements were already in high gear. The operation got underway quickly and efficiently. You had to be impressed. Young as they were, these men moved like veterans, like pros with years of experience. Officers and enlisted men all worked as a team. You don't get this good just by accident. There must be a good reason. I hadn't yet discovered just what it was. Almost from the moment this operation began, the Sky Soldiers met scattered enemy resistance. Today, for four days, the brigade moved ahead. Sometimes through jungle, so dense you could hardly see the sky. Other times over fields where there was no cover at all. Everywhere the insects. And the heat pressing down like lead. Although the Viet Cong were hard to find and refused to hold their ground, many bunkers were uncovered. Viet Cong base camps were rendered useless and their supplies captured to distribute to local villagers. At the end of the fourth day, the brigade was picked up and returned to Benoit. The only way to get to know an outfit is to stay with it in camp as well as in the field. During the next few weeks, talking to the men gave me an opportunity to learn the brigade's background and explain much of the reason for its esprit de corps and its efficiency in combat. The 173rd was activated June 25, 1963, around a nucleus of the 2nd Airborne Battle Group of the 503rd Infantry, a direct descendant of the 503rd Parachute Infantry Regiment, known as the Rock, which had jumped on Corregidor in World War II. Around these men, they formed a balanced airborne combat force. It was the first and only separate airborne brigade in the United States Army. For two years, these men under the command and guidance of General Williamson and his staff had been working and training together until they'd been forged into a unique self-supporting strike force capable of handling any emergency, any time, any place. These fighting men had trained in Okinawa, Thailand, 
the Philippines, and Taiwan. Their jungle skills had been honed razor sharp, and every last one was a qualified jumper. Airborne all the way. This was truly a crack outfit where reenlistment often ran as high as 100%. And you can't get better than that. Although the brigade mounted many attacks in an area northeast of Saigon called War Zone D, which was supposed to be an impregnable Viet Cong fortress, contact with the enemy was always light and scattered. The VC preferred to lose large amounts of food and supplies and to give up their bases rather than stand and fight. It wasn't long before the Sky Soldiers found out why. Along with some captured supplies, documents were found which read, avoid fighting with the men who carry the little black rifles unless you have a much stronger force than they have. About this time, the brigade took on an international flavor. Attached to it were Australian troops, veterans of the Malaysian campaign, trained in counter-guerrilla warfare. These battle-seasoned soldiers were a welcome addition, fitting right in with the rest of the unit. These Aussies were soon to be joined by troops from neighboring New Zealand. In July, War Zone D was the scene of a massive attack against the Viet Cong. Vietnamese soldiers fought side by side with the troopers of the 173rd. It was a large scale operation, with the full resources of the brigade employed against the Viet Cong. When the 173rd moves out on an operation like this, 60% of its support troops accompany the combat unit. At first, the fighting was light with little opposition. Then it got tougher. The Sky Soldiers are tough, aggressive fighters. And the deeper into the jungle they went, the fiercer the fighting got. Wherever the enemy was too deeply entrenched, the artillery blasted them loose. General Williamson's policy was, spend bullets, not bodies. The operation lasted four days and was a tremendous success. There were more than 400 Viet Cong casualties and 50 prisoners captured. Over 100 tons of weapons and supplies had been taken. And thousands of documents captured, which proved to be a gold mine for intelligence. The brigade moved on from success to success. Quoc Tui where a Viet Cong supply route was destroyed. Play coup in Kantum in the central highland to lift the siege and clear the roads for an Arvin relief column. And the so-called Iron Triangle. The Iron Triangle was an area where no friendly forces had set foot for more than a year. Air Force strikes, artillery fire, and army gunships prepared the way. Then the infantry moved in, sweeping through the jungle. Despite the fact that the enemy was strongly dug in in many areas, the Sky Soldiers rooted them out. And kept pressing right on.
But in combat, even the victors must suffer casualties. Fortunately, the Sky Soldier's casualties were light. The medics exposed themselves time and again to care for the wounded. Vietnam, Dust Off is the affectionate code name for the medical evacuation helicopter. And they perform miracles in getting in and out of almost impossible spots. It took six days to work through the Iron Triangle. But when it was over, the Viet Cong had lost over a hundred men, six camps, and thousands of pounds of supplies and food. The myth of the Iron Triangle had been broken and was to stay that way for over a year. As important as defeating the Viet Cong is the need to win the loyalty of the Vietnamese people. To this end, the men of the brigade applied themselves with the same spirit they showed in facing the enemy. A well-rounded program of civic action was initiated. An important part of it was routine medical treatment. To help the Vietnamese help themselves, heavy equipment was provided to build and restore roads. Men volunteered their free time to help in the construction of schools. And in educating the Vietnamese. Food and clothing were provided for villagers who had fled from Viet Cong oppression. For the first time in more than a year, many of the villagers were able to go freely to church, one that the 173rd had helped them to build. Sanitary wells were dug in villages that had never had clean, pure water. On their own time, and in some cases out of their own pockets, the Sky Soldiers undertook the sponsorship of orphanages and helped refurbish schools and playgrounds for the children. One of the brigade's most unique missions was Operation U Life. For more than two years, the Viet Cong had controlled the rice harvest in this rich and fertile area. The mission was to drive out the VC, restore government control, and protect the harvest. In addition to the airlifted troops, long-range ground patrols helped to forge a long chain, which grew tighter as the troops swept across the area. By moving at night as well as by day, the 173rd broke another myth that only the Viet Cong dared to move in the dark. By such actions, the Sky Soldiers began to win the confidence of the local population and to loosen the grip of terror that the VC held over the Vietnamese peasants. Kindness and decent treatment of the villagers, as well as the work of the civic action teams, resulted in bringing entire villages over to the side of the government. More than 300 of the VC were captured in this operation and the local Viet Cong battalion defeated. For the first time in two years, the people of the region harvested their crop without fear and the local government could once again function. As proof of the effectiveness of civic action and psychological warfare efforts, nearly 60 ralliers or defectors from the Viet Cong came in with their weapons to surrender. For the 173rd, the missions continued.
There was Operation Marauder directed against the VC battalion. They defeated the battalion and captured rosters which identified every man belonging to the local VC. In Operation Crimp, they uncovered a VC base camp in Hobo Woods, which included a tunnel complex that was three miles long and six levels deep. Operation followed operation. Dexter. Yorktown. Aurora 1. Aurora 2. Hardyhood. And Toledo with little or no break between operations. Operation Sioux City took them back to Zone D once again. Once more, the Viet Cong avoided full contact. But large stores of clothing, weapons, and other supplies were captured. The last operation I saw the 173rd carry out was Junction City. This was to be the largest multi-division operation to date. The target was War Zone C, near the Cambodian border, northwest of Saigon. The entire brigade was committed. But this time, there was a difference. This was to be the first parachute deployment by American forces in the Vietnam conflict. The planes are bigger and faster today, but this is how it must have been when the old 503rd parachuted down on Corregidor in World War II. This is how it is with the men of the 173rd. No one hesitates, each one is raring to go. Security was good, but there was some VC ground fire aimed at the paratroopers. A few of the jumpers found holes in their chutes to bear this out, but the only injuries were a few sprained ankles. When the jumpers were on the ground, the VC really opened up. The first job was to secure the drop zone. When it was secure, the C-130s began dropping the heavy stuff equipment, and supplies. Operation Junction City was the biggest in Vietnam up to that time. Men of the 173rd did their job all the way. wondered what makes an outfit like the 173rd Airborne the way it is. Part of it is due to the men who lead it, like General Williamson, who was responsible for organizing and shaping. And General Smith, who took command in Vietnam in 1966. Followed by General Dean, who led the jump in Operation Junction City. Part of it is the training. The tougher the going gets, the better they seem to like it. Mostly, it's pride. Pride in being part of an elite outfit of volunteers. One of the pros. They don't brag, but one of their infantry battalions was presented the Distinguished Unit Citation by General Westmoreland. By the time I left, they had four Medal of Honor winners among them, scores of silver stars, 
and they don't bother to count their Purple Hearts. These are the men of the 173rd Airborne Brigade, separate, airborne, all the way. By now, most of the men of the 173rd that I knew have rotated in new assignments. The ranks are filled with new names and faces. But the Sky Soldiers are still in Vietnam, fighting and working to help the Vietnamese people to build a free society of their own choice. And they'll probably stay until the job is done. Well done. 